Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Space Week Live for this Sunday, February 27th, 2022. It has been a very eventful week, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's just jump right into it. On Thursday, February 24th, just after midnight UTC, Russia invaded Ukraine, a country of 44 million people. They attacked with tanks, planes, troops, and ships from three sides, north, east, and south. This is a culmination of hostilities that have been ongoing since 2014, when Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine. Annexation is a polite word for conquered or stole. Why am I talking about geopolitics in a show about space? Because both Russia and Ukraine are major players in the field of aerospace and both have extensive ties to other countries' space pursuits, particularly Russian rockets and spacecraft and Ukrainian engines. First, though, a side note about the spelling and pronunciation of the Ukrainian capital, which I actually just learned a couple of days ago. So, having grown up in the Cold War era myself, uh, I was accustomed to pronouncing the capital of Ukraine as Kiev, uh, with the spelling K-I-E-V, or the, the Romanized spelling of K-I-E-V. But that's actually a Russification of, of the name. That is, it's a, it's a Russian-derived uh, version of the name. Since Ukraine gained independence, or self-declared self, uh, their independence in 1991, the preferred spelling of the city's name is Kyiv, or K-Y-I-V. Uh, is the Romaniza Romanization of that word. So I will be pronouncing it as Kiev. Um, uh, I will try to remember to do that because, again, I grew up pronouncing it differently. But anyway, a little, little backstory on that. So uh, why is this relevant to space? So uh, the Cygnus cargo craft that just arrived at the ISS last week was launched on a Northrop Grumman Antares rocket. Uh, Antares' first stage uses two RD-191 engines, which are built in Russia. Cygnus can also be flown on a ULA Atlas V rocket, but Atlas V's first stage core booster uses an RD-180 engine, also made in Russia. Post-2014, there was a discussion of manufacturing the RD-180 here in the U.S., but it was determined that it would cost more than a billion dollars and take five years in order to ramp up that development, and those plans never materialized. Vega, launched by Ariane Space from their facility in Kourou, French Guiana, is a four-stage rocket uh, made mostly in Italy. The first three stages use solid propellant, but the fourth stage is called the Attitude Vernier up, Upper Module, or AVUM. It uses a Ukrainian-made RD-843 liquid-fueled engine, uh, which, is, as you may recall, a couple years ago, the AVUM engine uh, experienced a glitch during a launch which caused the loss of, uh, of the payload. But uh, in any case, uh, so that engine is manufactured in the Ukraine. Additionally, during the first couple days of the conflict, uh, there were rumors that the Yuzhnoi and Yuzhmash facilities were destroyed. Those are Ukrainian uh, manufacturing facilities that make rocket engines and components. Uh, however, fortunately, it appears that those initial reports were incorrect uh, and that those plants are still intact. Uh, even if they aren't physically damaged, though, production will surely be disrupted for some time due to the, uh, the uh, general damage to the infrastructure in Ukraine and political uncertainty as to what may come about there. Uh, and even if, if, Russia wins and, if Russia wins and takes over Ukraine, uh, who knows what will happen with those facilities. Uh, and if Russia is repelled and Ukraine stabilizes, the extensive sanctions that have been um, imposed, that have been and will be imposed on Russia, may limit or eliminate long-standing space, 
partnerships between Russia and the EU and US. So much of the space-related drama of the past few days has been exacerbated by statements and tweets from Dmitry Rogozin, the director general of Roscosmos and the former deputy prime minister of Russia. Um, so here in this series of tweets that I translated, he basically blasts um, back at President Joe Biden regarding the proposal of sanctions against Russia. Uh, and I'll try to read through this pretty quickly. This is a translation from Google, so if some of this is uh, a little, a little uh, um, messy, then, then I apologize for that. Uh, Biden said the news, and this is from Dmitry Rogozin. Uh, he, he is pretty straightforward and, and shoots from the hip with his tweets, uh, not unlike Elon Musk, although Elon Musk is not a political figure. Biden said the new sanctions would affect the Russian space program. Okay, it remains to find out the details. Do you want to block our access to radiation-resistant space microelectronics? So you already did it quite officially in 2014. As you noticed, we none, nevertheless continue to make our own spacecraft, and we will do them by expanding the production of the necessary components and devices at home. Two, do you want to ban all countries from launching their spacecraft on the most reliable Russian rockets in the world? This is how you are already going, doing this and planning to finally destroy the world market of space competition from January 1st, 2023 by imposing sanctions on our launch vehicles. We are aware. This is not news either. We are ready to act here too. Three, do you want to destroy our cooperation on the ISS? This is how you already do it by limiting exchanges between our cosmonaut and astronaut training centers. Or do you want to manage the ISS yourself? Maybe President Biden is off topic, so explain to him that the correction of the station's orbit, its avoidance of dangerous rendezvous with space garbage, with which your talented businessmen, presumably referring to Elon Musk, have polluted the near-Earth orbit, is produced exclusively by the engines of the Russian Progress MS cargo ships. If you block cooperation with us, who will save the ISS from an uncontrolled deorbit and fall into the United States or Europe? There is also the option of dropping a 500-ton structure to India or China. Do you want to threaten them with such a prospect? The ISS does not fly over Russia, so all the risks are yours. Are you ready for them? Gentlemen, when planning sanctions, check those who generate them. Okay, well, anyway, that's, that's a little too political. Uh, to prevent your sanctions from falling on your head, and not only in a figurative sense. Therefore, for the time being, as a partner, I suggest that you do not behave like an irresponsible gamer. Disavow the statement about these sanctions. Friendly advice. So very strong words from the head of the Russian space program. Uh, then yesterday, oh yes, in response, um, not in response, but uh, as a follow-up to that, we have this tweet from Jonathan McDowell, uh, who is a, uh, uh, an, ast an astronomer at the Center for Astrophysics, saying, well, Rogozin isn't dumping ISS in the sea just yet. And this was on February 26th, so yesterday. Um, Progress MS-18 made a regular one-kilometer orbit boost of the station at 0122 UTC, February 26th. So, um, and it's been discussed, what if, you know, what if the cosmonauts are instructed to cut themselves off from the astronauts, uh, you know, the, the Russian and the U.S. Uh, halves of the space station? That's not going to happen. Uh, the co cosmonauts and, and, and astronauts, both American, European, Japanese, uh, and elsewhere, um, are consummate professionals and transcend petty geopolitics. Um, even if ordered to take actions uh, that are politically motivated, uh, I believe, and they have done in the past, they have, they have disobeyed those orders. They, they really um, exemplify the spirit of international cooperation and they transcend the day-to-day the -day politics of, of those of us on the ground. So uh, I don't think we have to worry about, you know, space wars or whatever. Um, 
Then, let's see. Yesterday, Rogozin himself, Dmitry Rogozin, tweeted, and this is a translation, in response to EU sanctions against our enterprises, Roscosmos suspends cooperation with European partners in organizing space launches from the Cosmodrome in Kourou and withdraws its technical staff, including the consolidated starting crew from French Guiana. Now, what does this mean? This means no more Ariane Space Soyuz launches from French Guiana for the time being. Ariane Space can still launch Ariane 5 and Vega rockets, or perhaps just Ariane 5, if they can no longer reliably source the Ukrainian RD-843 engine for Vega's upper stage. Uh, I don't know how many engines Ariane Space keeps in reserve, but at least for the time being, there will be no more Soyuz launches from French Guiana. And then earlier today, <clears throat> Rogozin tweeted, a massive distributed denial of service attack, this is a, a computer thing, from various IP addresses has been carried out on the Roscosmos website for several days now. Its organizers may think that this affects something. I will answer, this only affects the timely awareness of space enthusiasts about Roscosmos news. There are social networks through which we will bring this information, such as Twitter, which they have done. As for the management of the industry, the orbital constellation and the Russian segment of the ISS, these channels are securely protected and isolated from cyber criminals. Um, so he, he makes a good point. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to side myself with, with uh, him in any particular way, but, but he does make a good point that DDoS attacks against the public-facing website are not going to hurt their business. Uh, it's only going to affect their visibility to the public. You know, that is people like you and me or the average Russian citizen who uh, is visiting the Roscosmos website, uh, you know, to get information about launches or whatever. Uh, it's not going to hinder them from conducting their, their operations uh, in any way. <clears throat> uh, in other news, uh, in the same uh, theater, reports that the one-of-a-kind Antonov AN-225 Miria, the heaviest airplane ever built, with the widest wingspan of any operational aircraft, has been destroyed by Russian forces at an airfield near Kiev. Its name, Miria, means dream or inspiration in Ukrainian. Let's take a step back and look at this, take a look at this marvel of aeronautical engineering. So the AN-225 was originally built back in 1988 to carry the Soviet Buran space shuttle, as well as parts of the Energia rocket. It can carry 225,000 kilograms, or 555,000 pounds internally, or 200,000 kilograms, 440,000 pounds, on top of the upper fuselage, which we see there, uh, the Buran orbiter sitting on top of it. The American analog would be the specially modified 747, which uh, carried the U.S. Space Shuttle. Uh, its maximum takeoff weight is 11% more than the largest passenger plane, the Airbus A380. So this is a six-engine uh, plane that is an absolute monster. And it's been flying ever since it was, uh, I think it, there were a few years in which it was not used, but it's been, it was manufactured in 1988, and it's been flying since shortly thereafter. Uh, here's another look at the takeoff with sound. beast. 
And here we have another view uh, from the unique vantage point of the tail wing, which it has. This, this particular airplane has a very wide tail wing. fold under kind of reminds me of um, of the the, uh, the first Avengers movie with the um, the things flying through the uh, flying through New York anyway with the like drop pods underneath anyway um, <laughs> so uh, was it really the Maria that was destroyed here is an image of uh, the second copy of an AN-225 that was partially constructed back in the late 1980s, but was never finished. It was stored in a Ukrainian hangar all these years. Uh, perhaps it was that unfinished plane that was bombed rather than the actual production AN-225. Uh, not according to Ukraine's official Twitter account, which said... The biggest plane in the world, Maria, the dream, was destroyed by Russian occupants on an airfield near Kiev. We will rebuild the plane. We will fulfill our dream of a strong, free, and democratic Ukraine. Another tweet from Ukraine's Minister of Foreign Affairs. This was the world's largest aircraft, AN-225 Maria, dream in Ukrainian. Russia may have destroyed our Maria, but they will never be able to destroy our dream of a strong, free, and democratic European state. We shall prevail. Uh, the Antonov company itself was more cautious, stating, Currently, until the AN-225 has been inspected by experts, we cannot report on the technical condition of the aircraft. Stay tuned for further official announcement. And that was as of this morning, so... Obviously, they're not going to go in there until the active hostilities have subsided uh, one way or the other, regardless of who ends up in, ch uh, in charge of the, com the country. But um, if the AN-225 indeed was destroyed, as it appears to have been based on the statements of the, the official sources, um, let's hope that they do rebuild it because it was a very cool and unique aircraft. Uh, they may they may modify the design because they no longer have a need to carry the Buran space shuttle, but um, having a super heavy uh, craft like that that is unique in the world is uh, a real tra tragic thing to lose. Um, so as is usually the case in times of conflict and chaos, the details of events can be muddy, and the full truth is not known until the dust settles. In happier news, we had some live space events with last week. Early last Monday, the Cygnus SS Piers Sellers spacecraft was captured and berthed at the space station uh, two days after it launched. On board was 3,651 kilograms or 8,049 pounds of cargo. Of particular note, this is the first Cygnus craft and the first commercial craft of any kind that will perform an operational reboost of the ISS. Uh, harking, harkening, harkening, harking? Ooh, I need to look that up. Back to Rogozin's tweet about boosting the ISS with progress modules, or progress spacecraft. So typically ISS reboosts are performed by Russian progress vehicles, uh, but uh, Cygnus and perhaps uh, SpaceX Dragon craft may have similar capability, so we shall see. Uh, however, if I recall correctly, Cygnus berths to essentially the center of the station, and so while it would be able to boost the station, it wouldn't be able to provide the station with any kind of attitude control. Um, 
But uh, so back in 2018, Cygnus number nine did a brief test boost. Whoa, a brief test boost, but it only raised the station's orbit by about 90 meters. This time the orbit will, will be raised by a kilometer or more. In preparation for the reboost, the station's attitude will be rotated by about 90 degrees. Basically, they will steer or aim with the station's onboard attitude control thrusters while Cygnus provides the thrust. Later that same day, hmm. Later that same day, a Falcon 9 launched Starlink 4-8 from Cape Canaveral. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engines full power. Lift off, Starlink 4-8. Vehicle switching down range. M1D chamber pressure is nominal. And the booster landing. Uh, lately, the footage of the booster landings have, has been pretty ratty, but um, but here you go. In any case. Stage one, leg to play. Stage one, landing confirmed. Seco one. And great news. We heard that Falcon 9 has landed, touched down on a shortfall of Gravitas. We also heard, there it is on your screen, incredible view of the vehicle standing Not tall. Insertion. And we also had... Thanks for that, Jesse Anderson. And on Thursday... Oh, wait, what do we got here? This is... Engine test. On Thursday, NASA conducted another hot fire test of an RS-25 developmental engine for the Artemis program. Sorry for the delay. I had to <laughs> project a message to upstairs because one of my kids is making a whole bunch of noise. Okay, so um, engine number 525 fired for the full duration of about 500 seconds or eight and a half minutes, which is the length of time it will need to, to thrust during the actual Artemis missions. Let's see if I can <clears throat> find the... Uh, Lay them out. There we go. And there you go. Then on Friday, Another Falcon 9 launched Starlink 4-11 from Vandenberg in California. You may notice that the Starlink mission number jumped from 8 to 11. 9 and 10 have not yet launched. Sometimes the mission numbers get shuffled around based on the order in which the batches of satellites are launched. Chamber 
pressures are nominal. Looking good. And the landing, this time on the uh, ever popular Of Course I Still Love You, uh, which, as you may recall, was relocated from Florida to California uh, when they, uh, well, I think for maintenance is why they moved it back there. So they have two in Florida, just read the instructions, and a short fall of Gravitas, which is uh, the latter is what the previous launch landed on. And then, of course, I Still Love You is stationed out in California. And here's stage one landing burn. Of our drone ship, we just heard the call out that the stage one landing burn has started. So if we are successful, this will be the fourth time that this booster has successfully landed. Stage one landing leg deploy. Hearing call outs that we did get the landing legs deployed. Waiting for audio or visual confirmation of that first stage. And there stage it is. One landing confirmed. Right in the middle of our drone ship. One. That is a successful first stage landing, the fourth for this particular first stage booster. Good job. And so for the last few Starlink launches, uh, we haven't gotten to see the deployment of the satellites because they had loss of signal at the time. They had an expected loss of signal at the time that the um, satellites were deployed. But this time we did. So here it is. Uh, it's, I'm actually playing it at two times speed because they deploy a little bit slowly for this broadcast. The retaining arm gets pulls away and the satellites float off into their target or in well into their initial orbits which are as you may recall starlinks they uh, they launch into a low orbit they are then they then undergo a series of tests to, to make sure they're working okay and then they are raised into their production their their target orbits uh, and this is what caused the loss of those 43 I think was it 43? Uh, Starlink satellites from the February 3rd launch uh, because of the geomagnetic storm the Starlinks were folded up into a uh, sort of a hunkered down or, or a safe mode position uh, in order to weather the, the um, um, in order to, to fly through the, the increased atmospheric drag and um, also as a resistance measure versus the uh, the extrasolar radiation they were experiencing and uh, they were unable to raise themselves to their target orbits which is why they were lost but uh, let's see here all right so yesterday a long march 4c doo -doo -doo, launched the LSAR-1B synthetic aperture radar satellite from Zhuquan in the Gobai Desert of northwest China. Its sister satellite, LSAR-1A, was launched last month. According to official sources, they will be used to monitor the geological environment, landslides, and earthquakes. SAR, of course, has many other uses, but they never talk about those. It's unsurprising that almost every government satellite launch has the stated purpose of environmental monitoring and disaster relief. Um, not to be cynical, but it is what it is. And just a reminder, the white things that are falling off the rocket are not chunks of ice. They are, uh, this is a solid propelled rocket, I believe. But um, 
uh, those are insulation panels that are intended to um, insulate the payload fairing and the parts of the rocket from uh, environmental, uh, uh, you know, the weather, basically. All right. And then finally, late last night or early this morning, depending on where you are, a Long March 8Y2, which is the second Long March 8 and the first to launch with just the core rocket, no side boosters, lifted off from Wenchang in far southern China with 22 small satellites that will be used for commercial remote sensing, marine environment monitoring, forest fire prevention, and disaster mitigation. I guess that's all the live, the uh, actual footage we get from that one. So, um, doop, there we go. All right. So that actually is it for last week. Um, now, looking ahead to this week, well, first of all, before I get into this week, I'd like to point out, you may notice the Starlink uh, Dishy McFlatface or Dishy um, behind me. That's That's my Starlink dish. I did go ahead and uh, cancel the service, as I have discussed in previous episodes. Um, it was a hard decision, and I'm kind of miffed about it, but um, I just can't justify the expense right now. And so uh, I still have the dish, uh, but I, I won't have the service. So for the time being, it is a background, a very expensive background decoration. Um, uh, I might sell the dish, or I might keep it in anticipation of um, when Starlink's support for mobile usage is enabled, so that when when you can use Starlink from locations other than your your home, you know, I mean, you can use the dish within maybe 10 miles of your house, but once you go farther than that, <clears throat> because of the way the the um, SpaceX Starlink cell, you know, grid is, is uh, set up, uh, you're, you're not going to get service if you take it up into the mountains or to the beach or whatever. But if they do enable their mobile service, especially if I can manage to get the, uh, the <laughs> get the channel views back on track so that I can actually uh, cover the cost with, uh, with channel revenues, then um, uh, I'll already have the dish and I won't need to buy a new one if the same dish is compatible. Now they do have a new dish, which is like square in form factor rather than round. Um, but uh, again, I don't know there, but there's no, there's no concrete news as to when or if they're actually going to roll out their, their mobile service. Um, so everybody's kind of waiting on that. But until that time, let's look at the space events of the coming week. So on Monday, February 28th at 3.35 p.m. Eastern, 2035 UTC, a Rocket Lab Electron rocket will launch the Strix Beta satellite in a mission called the Owl's Night Continues for Japanese-based Sinspective. Uh, this mission has been delayed a couple of times. I talked about it in previous weeks, but uh, currently the scheduled launch time is tomorrow uh, afternoon, my time. It is the successor to the Strix Alpha, the Owl's Night Begins mission, which launched back in 2020. And this beta satellite is the first of three launches for Synspective that are scheduled for this and next year. On Tuesday, March 1st at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC, a ULA Atlas V will launch the GOES-T satellite for NASA and the National Oceani Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now, uh, GOES-T will be the third weather satellite in the state-of-the-art GOES-R series. GOES stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. Um, GOES is a little catchier name than the full, the full acronym. <clears throat> 
the design and planning of the GOES-R system began 23 years ago in 1999. Construction of the first satellite, GOES-16, didn't begin until 2012. It launched in November 2016 on an Atlas V, the same as the GOES-T will. It spent a year doing non-operational validation and testing, and finally, after a month of being drifted into its final geostationary orbit, <clears throat> In December 2017, it was declared fully operational, uh, replacing GOES-13 to become the new GOES-East. And I'm sorry this video is a little choppy. It, it, it's just the browser playing a 4K video is uh, not doing so well. Uh, if I played it in my video software, it would be nice and smooth. But in any case, you can watch these kinds of satellite time-lapse videos all day long if you want to because my channel, uh, one of my channel features is a 24-7 music stream with uh, satellite time lapses, just like this. Um, from Goes East, Goes West, Himawari 8, and maybe even some Electro-L uh, time lapses from the Russian satellite. But uh, please check that out because it's always available and it is quite beautiful and quite cool, and it's not jumpy like this. <laughs> um, the second satellite, GOES-17, was, was launched in March 2018 and replaced GOES-15 as NOAA's operational GOES-West satellite 11 months later. Unfortunately, there was a problem with GOES-17's loop heat pipe that transports heat from the cryocooler and the advanced baseline imager instrument to heat dissipating radiators. It was unable to keep the main instrument cool enough to operate at 100% all the time, so only 10 to 13 of the 16 channels or wavelengths it observes are available 24 seven, with the others available for varying lengths of time depending on the season. For example, at the solstices, uh, they get more sunlight, whereas at the equinoxes they get, or they get less sunlight, whereas at the equinoxes they get uh, uh, more sunlight. This cooling problem was fixed for GOES-T, but caused its launch to be delayed by a couple of years while they worked on the problem, and it will be launching again this Tuesday. Once GOES-T arrives at geostationary orbit, it will be renamed to GOES-18, and once it completes its checkouts and replaces GOES-17, it will become the new GOES-West. GOES-U is the fourth and final GOES-R satellite, planned to launch in 2024 to replace GOES-East and extend the GOES system's operational availability out to the year 2036. Moving ahead, on Wednesday, March 2nd, there is a new moon. Um, <laughs> if you have clear skies, get out there and do some stargazing because you'll have good viewing. Then on Thursday, March 3rd, at 9.32 a.m. Eastern, 14.32 UTC, <clears throat> is a, another Falcon 9 launch with the Starlink 4-9 mission. Uh, remember, we're having to make up 9 and 10 <clears throat> because they already launched 8 and 11. So this will be Starlink 4.9, and this will be launching from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Typically, the way they do Starlink launches, uh, there will be one from the front, one from Kennedy, one from Cape Canaveral, and one from Vandenberg, or they'll flip flop between Kennedy and Cape Canaveral, depending on their launch cadence. <clears throat> but if they have them in rapid succession, then there will usually be, um, you know, they'll usually cycle through all three. Kennedy, Cape, and Vandenberg, which are the three sites that Falcon 9s currently launch from. And then on Friday, March 4th, at 5.41 p.m. Eastern, 22, um, 10, I'm sorry, 2241 UTC, uh, <laughs> a Soyuz rocket, an Ariane Space-managed Russian-built Soyuz rocket will be launching from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with the OneWeb 14 batch of 36 OneWeb satellites. 
Now, again, this is one of the things which there is concern, uh, one of the projects which there is concern may be impacted by sanctions against Russia, because um, even though it's la launching from a Russian leased facility, that is the Baikonur Cosmodrome, <clears throat> um, it's nonetheless uh, a Russian rocket. And uh, they'll probably find a way to make the OneWeb launches continue and proceed uh, as scheduled or close thereto, but uh, I don't know. We shall see. You know, sometimes the law uh, gets in the way of conducting business. So, and sometimes that's appropriate. You know, that's what the point of sanctions are: is to Im impose some financial hurt. Uh, but for now, we have a OneWeb launch scheduled for uh, Friday the fourth, and that is. Uh, that is it for the coming week. I'd like to take a moment to thank and welcome our newest channel member, Rocket Prophet, who uh, joined as a Rostronaut last week. Now, let me take a look, look at the chat and answer some of your questions. Um, now, unfortunately, I did not say this up front, but if you do have any questions, uh, please make sure to tag my name at raw space. That way I'm sure to see them. So regarding the AN-225, there are rumors that it was not destroyed, but uh, according to the official uh, Ukrainian government, it was destroyed. Um, according to Antonov, we are waiting and seeing what exactly its condition is. So, and somebody claimed that the AN-225, the AN-225 wasn't even in that hemisphere, so I'm not sure where that information is coming from. But again, uh, the, the term fog of war doesn't exist for no reason. Um, it's hard to know what, what is really going on until active hostilities subside and we're, we're able to get in there and see what the state of things is. Iwo Wazanuski, before we land on Mars, we need to master propulsive landing on the Earth and the Moon. That's for sure true. Um, we have, I mean, we're good at landing Falcon 9 boosters on Earth, but we've never uh, propulsively landed a, I mean, a reusable rocket on um, the Moon. We, we've landed landers, but those are one-time use sort of things would be prohibitively expensive uh, in this day and age. Mark Desaire, landing on Mars is quite difficult because it has almost no atmosphere. You can't really use it for braking. It has a substantial gravitational field. And of course, no planetary magnetosphere, which causes radiation hazards. All right. <laughs> Kenneth says, the universe is not required to be in perfect harmony with human ambition. You got that right. We are but motes of dust. Even less, even less than. I think that the um, leadership uh, invoking these sorts of conflicts that are currently like the one that are the one that's currently happening in the Ukraine need to go back and re-listen to um, Carl Sagan's pale blue dot speech because it was very poignant and uh, puts things in a different perspective. And if uh, I delay in between speaking, I'm sorry, I'm just scanning the chat for questions. I need to uh, implement an automatic uh, chat scrubber that, that 
picks out the, the questions or that picks out the, uh, the the tags of my name. Who's your daddy? Says stock up on iodine. Hmm. It's always a concern. Also, um, the Russians did overtake the Chernobyl nuclear facility, which I was not aware actually does still contain an active uh, reactor, which provides power to parts of Kiev. Um, of course, of course, the uh, the nineteen eighty six um, reactor that melted down is under containment, but Bennu is checking out my Starlink back there. But uh, but uh, at the same site, there is another reactor which is active. And uh, the Russians took it over, which, you know, power, bridges, airfields, highways, things like that are prime military targets. So... Real Sven, one of our friends actually in uh, the Ukraine area, uh, apparently he made it to Moldova. Um, a couple days ago he was in eastern Ukraine, but I guess he made it out. So good job, good job, Real Sven, on staying safe. Geraldine Braun, might the space agency call upon Falcon Heavy to fill in the temporary losses? So I remember earlier I mentioned um, the GOES satellites launching on an Atlas V, which uses Russian-made engines. Well, GOES-U, which is the next GOES satellite to be launched in 2024, uh, is scheduled to be launched on a Falcon Heavy booster rather than an Atlas V. <clears throat> and this this scheduling predated the, the current conflict in Ukraine, so. <clears throat> James Gray, will the ISS depart from the Russian segment? So uh, it can't really. Uh, there are two, the, the two halves of the ISS, or rather the two halves of the the habitable um, modules of the ISS are too integrated. There are services that are provided by the Russian modules. There are services that are provided by the international slash US modules. And uh, while the power, the, the, the solar arrays uh, all route through in it, the international modules or the US modules, um, the, the Russian modules still provide, uh, they provide thrust, they provide attitude control, they provide, I think, some maybe air filtration or water filtration or something. Um, there's numerous integrations between the two halves of the space station. You can't just cut them off. And the last time I saw a fly-through of the space station, uh, occasionally NASA will show, you know, one of these fly-throughs where an astronaut will hold a camera and just fly through the whole space station. There were literally a whole bunch of hoses and wires draped through the hatch in between the U.S. and Russian uh, modules. And so, I mean, obviously you can't close that uh, without disconnecting all of those hoses and wires, which are used for something. So... Um, Mark Dozer, I knew that the West uses Russian-designed rocket engines, but hadn't realized to what extent. Yeah, yeah, we actually are quite dependent upon Russian-made engines, which, I mean, come on, you know, co international cooperation is very admirable, but strategically, we should absolutely have developed uh, domestic alternatives, at least, uh, more so than has been done. But um, I suppose the political will was not there to spend the money to, to make it happen. Um, <laughs> Yazata says, so Jeff had better get his engines, Jeff referring to Jeff Bezos, um, founder of Blue Origin, had better get his engines, referring to the BE-4, to Tori, referring to Tori, 
<laughs> Tori Amos, referring to uh, uh, Tori Bruno, head of ULA. Quick, if Russian engines won't be coming. So, yeah, the uh, the new Vulcan Centaur rocket is going to be using uh, BE-4, presumably going to be using BE-4 engines for its first stage. And those BE-4s have been much delayed in their development by Blue Origin. Uh, so light a fire under that billionaire. Make it happen. Let's see. Uh, mm, okay. Ah, Snow Kitten says ULA already has every engine for the remaining Atlas Vs, so ULA is fine. <clears throat> so, um, uh, yeah, I do know they, they've purchased, I think the total number of RD-180 engines that, that uh, ULA has purchased is something like 122. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what their current backlog is, like, uh, not backlog, but the, what their current uh, uh, stockpile is, but uh, apparently they do, they do have enough for the planned Atlas V launches. And I'm sorry, my voice voice is cutting out. <clears throat> I'm not really built for long uh, long speeches. All right. Ah, uh, Gordon Freeman. U Ukraine littered Twitter with fakes. Why isn't anyone fighting this? Yeah, there's a lot of political back and forth going on um, in the Twitterverse and elsewhere, um, uh, online, other social media outlets. And, uh, uh, you know, ultimately Twitter is not going to decide the fates of nations, but um, it does get the, the people riled up. So um, I agree with Nico M that everyone should just calm down and go back to the negotiation table. There are no winners in a war. Uh, Yazata says the U.S. should be able to build a propulsion module for the ISS. I would think so. Uh, and I, I wish I knew more about. I'm sure that there have been efforts along those lines, but I don't know. I don't know any details. Snow kittens regarding the AN225 says. Also, it was envisioned to carry Max, or M-A-K-S, like a mini shuttle, which would launch from its back. Not familiar with Max. That sounds cool. Iwo Wisniewski asks, can the Cygnus carry unpressurized cargo? Uh, no, the Cygnus does not, or rather Cygnus does not have a, an unpressurized trunk like the SpaceX Cargo Dragon does. Uh, and so Cygnus is not equipped to carry unpressurized cargo. The, 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 the interior of Cygnus is pressurized and it's, it opens directly into the interior of the space station. <clears throat> Tig is hearkening for a cheeseburger. Also, I want to uh, give special shout outs and thanks to Tig and Yazata for their contributions during this um, episode. Much appreciated. Yazata says 500 seconds is a, lo is a long burn. So, um, yeah, the main engine of of the space launch system will burn for eight and a half minutes on its way up. It is a long burn, but it's a big booster. <laughs> it's, it's a big rocket stage. TIG thinks they should use marshmallows during testing. There might not be much left, but that's an interesting idea. My kid is is doing an interpretive dance 
uh, by way of which to say hello. <laughs> uh, or Fortnite, or one of the others. Uh, Tig asks, are the Chinese still up in their space station? Uh, I'm not sure if they came back yet or not. Um, the, the Chinese comings and goings are uh, usually broadcast after the fact, and uh, I'd have to look it up. I don't remember if they came back, but there are periods of time in which the, the Chinese uh, Tiangong space station is unoccupied, unlike the ISS, which has been manned um, crude nonstop for uh, more than 20 years now. All right. Okay. Mark Desaire says, as far as he knows, the three, Chi the three Chinese taikonauts are planned to return in April. So thank you for that, Mark. Uncle Yukon, regarding Starlink, they are working on a mobile dish service. That's the rumor. I mean, that's what they've stated, but they, there's just no indication of when that will actually happen. So Starlink is great. Especially if you don't have good landline internet options where you live. I do have good landline options. I have broadband cable. I have fiber. My, my own personal service is Google Fiber, which is gigabit or up to two gigabit if I wanted to fork over the money for it, which I do not. But, um, but uh, uh, especially if you're in a rural area you know, or off on an island somewhere, uh, for example, SpaceX... Uh, brought a whole bunch of Starlink terminals to Tonga after the volcanic eruption and tsunami in order to help them get uh, internet connected again because they were cut off. And uh, so that's the kind of that's the kind of situation where Starlink is uh, is optimal, is ideal. And um, you know, so I don't technically need Starlink here, but. Uh, I would like to be able to use it when I go to remote locations because, you know, where there's not cell, cellular coverage. So I can do things like live streaming and, and whatnot. But uh, I've got the dish for it. I just, as of the end of this month, I will no longer have the service for it. <clears throat> RB had pizza for breakfast this morning. I had pizza for lunch today. Leftovers from last night. Space for everyone. Uh, and by the way, thanks to Space for Everyone for providing the business level um, access to Flight Radar 24 during my recent Ukraine live flight tracker stream. Uh, enabled enhanced uh, an en an enhancements to the interface with uh, features that aren't available for the basic users. Uh, so, Space for Everyone. Will China replace Russia if everything is going wrong in the side of Russia and join the International Space Station and dock the Chinese space station Tianhe-1 with the ISS. No, there's zero chance <clears throat> of the Chinese space station docking to the ISS. First of all, there's no uh, adapter to, to join the two. And secondly, China is specifically blocked from participating in the ISS project um, for political reasons. You know, by the, by Congress, basically. Uh, and so we, you know, they couldn't collaborate on the ISS even if they wanted to, which I doubt they want to. <clears throat> Peter Cortens asks, any idea how Rosca... Oops, it just jumped. Oh, dear me. Any idea how Roscosmos is doing since 2013? It, is there improvement? Uh, well, Roscosmos has been conducting uh, um, regular, regular launches. As we've seen on this channel, we, we stream most of them. Uh, any of the ones that are commercial or in any way related to the ISS, any of the launches for which there is a live stream. Uh, military launches from Plesetsk we don't have access to, but but that's normal. Um, but as far as the organization, how well they're doing, how well they're funded, I really don't have much insight into their into their the inner workings of Roscosmos. I know that Dmitry Rogozin is um, is a bold and 
outspoken figure, uh, as demonstrated by his recent tweets regarding the situation in Ukraine. But, uh, um, you know, he's probably does an effective job of, of managing the Roscosmos organization, but I don't know much, much detail about it. RB says that Russia is planning to join the Chinese space station. I mean, that is a match that makes sense. Russia and China collaborate on many things. They are of a similar mind in, in, uh, political aspects. And, um, most of the Chinese space apparatus was inspired by or uh, evolved from Russian designs. looking for more questions. People talking about pizza. Mark Desaire says that the GOES footage is impressive. It really is. I, I can't even tell you how much time I spend um, uh, gathering, collating, and uh, uh, rendering satellite time lapses for, not, not just for my 24-7 stream, but but it's kind of for posterity. Um, I'm not even sure why I do it, but I, I love the satellite views of Earth. And, um, you know, I have the videos from each of the satellites in 8K resolution, which I can't stream in 8K, but um, uh, I've been thinking of uploading some of the videos, but I don't want to flood my channel with a whole bunch of <clears throat> very similar looking satellite time lapses. So I'm not, maybe, maybe I'll upload it, leave it up for a week and then make it unlisted so that it's still there, but not like littering my front, the front page of my channel. Um, I don't know. We'll see, but I have, <clears throat> you know, dozens of hours of, of these videos that, uh, um, uh, I've compiled over the past couple of years. <laughs> Eve says we need a new moon. Um, that would be quite a trick. <laughs> uh, Peter S. says Russia has been cut from SWIFT. I think that's the financial transaction system, isn't it? Like credit cards um, or bank transfers, something like that. I'd, I'd, I've, only, I've only become vaguely aware of SWIFT because I, I did some, some work for an overseas... Um, uh, media agency, and uh, that was part of the paperwork. A Swift was mentioned, but that's not a system that I normally have any interaction with. RB has watched a couple Twilight launches, Twilight SpaceX launches from Vandenberg. Um, yeah, those are really spectacular, and they freak everybody out in Los Angeles because it looks like... Uh, I don't know, they, 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 <laughs> alien invasion or something. <clears throat> uh, Aben Waterman asks, what's stopping SpaceX from putting engines in Cargo Dragon to do boosting? So, um, Dragon already has engines. It is a self-propelled spacecraft. It, it has engines. It may need more fuel to do ISS boosting, but I think that Dragon is probably capable of boosting the, the ISS as is. Uh, they probably wouldn't need to make any modifications to it. Um, as, as far as whether the current design has enough fuel reserves to do ISS boosting and then return back to Earth safely, I'm not sure. Uh, normally progress Russian progress uh, spacecraft are are burned up. They are loaded with trash, and then deorbited, and they burn up. But um, Dragon is recovered. But Dragon doesn't need its fuel when it's when it's deorbiting. It it only needs enough fuel to conduct 
the deorbit maneuver, and then it's gravity and atmosphere and parachutes the rest of the way. Like it doesn't propulsively land itself. It, it, it slows itself down through aero braking and, uh, and then deploys parachutes. Mark Desaire, SpaceX is not exactly producing rocket engines like sausages. Um, it's an interesting, it evokes some interesting imagery, sausage rocket engines. Uh, Raw Space Addict asks, <laughs> love the name by the way, asks, does why, does YouTube streaming hold your place in stream when you change Wi-Fi sources? Um, I, I presume you're referring to if I change internet connections from, let's say, Google Fiber to Starlink. I believe I did test that one time, and um, uh, it can create a disruption in the, in the train, I mean, it create, it can create a glitch in the stream. So there may be some buffering, but, uh, I don't think it would kill the stream. Okay. Geraldine Braun, my kitty Alvin says, mew hello to Benu. Well, Benu says, Mew hello back, wherever he ran off to. RB, in war, no winners. Some sides just lose more than other sides. There is no victory in war. I agree. Uh, Mark Desaire, how about doing a live stream about me and my family? So I, I generally try to keep my f the my family separated from um, sort of professional endeavors, I guess you could say. Uh, there's a lot of weirdos out there, and um, you know, tr traditionally I've tried to insulate my family from that. Uh, but I mean, most of you do know that I'm a single dad of two um, teenagers, and uh, yeah, that's about the extent of it. <laughs> But uh, I wouldn't want to go into too much detail. Um, but uh, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> I can tell you that much. All right. Huh. Uncle Yukon says Switzerland has actually taken sides against Russia in the invasion. Interesting that they would choose a side at all. Usually Switzerland is the perfect sphere. No side whatsoever. Rocket fuel marshmallows. RB signed up for Ting Internet. A thousand gigabit download, a thousand gigabit upload. Okay. Eight percent of his gross income. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the provider, uh, fast internet can be very expensive. Um, you know, Google Fiber and AT&T Fiber are not, are not terribly expensive, but <clears throat> apparently Ting is. Looking for more questions. Yeah, Peter Corton's uh, 8K coming. We need new screens then. I don't even have an 8K screen. I mean, I render these videos in 8K, but the max I have is 4K. So, and most people don't even have 4K. So, it's kind of uh, overkill. But um, yeah. And then in my TV room, I've got a big TV, but it's only 1080p resolution. And uh, I, you know. Sometimes I even have to run it at 720p in order to read the text because my eyes <clears throat> uh, don't work that great at a distance. But um, Joe says that <clears throat> Ukraine makes rocket motors <clears throat> for Roscosmos. 
<clears throat> that's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, although, if, although if Russia takes over management of Ukraine, um, that supply line would might not be terribly disrupted. Uh, Morpheus, Lord of Oneroi, asks, would it be all right for me to reach out to you directly to ask some questions for a book I'm working on? Uh, yes, that would be fine. Uh, you can either um, direct message me on Discord, which uh, I will link in the chat, or contact me via email at rossbasevideos at gmail.com. Peter Cortens proposes that Dragon could do attitude control and Cygnus could do the boosting. Sure, sounds feasible to me. Crystallina Bacteria asks if I have a P.O. box. Um, I don't have a P.O. box, but I do have a virtual mailbox. Um, I think I have a command for that. But uh, So I've received um, a couple of a couple of uh, merch payments and and a uh, a gift from overseas uh, in my virtual mailbox, which is uh, a it's actually a Staples store, but they receive you know mail on behalf of people, and so um, physical mail can be addressed to the address that is listed in the chat, um, and it will get to me. I'll get notified that it's there, and I'll go and pick it up. All right. Okay. Looks like that is it. Um, I have run out of questions. Thank you all for coming. There was a lot, a lot of ground to cover this week. This is about a ninety-minute episode, which is quite long. Um, actually, not quite ninety minutes, but in any case, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, stay safe, especially if you're in Eastern Europe. Uh, keep it raw. And I will see you in the next live stream. Bye for now.